The Cartoonrific Podcast is sponsored by the Wonderful World of Animation Gallery, home of rare and wonderful fine animation art. Visit their website at www.gallery.com. And for our Cartoonrific listeners, you will receive a special 10% discount off any purchase if you purchase by March 25th, 2024. Just go to www.gallery.com and enter code CARTOON10 for your 10% discount. Once again, this discount is only valid until midnight, March 25th, 2024. Once again, visit www.gallery.com. The following is a Cartoonerific Studios presentation. Welcome to Cartoon Fun, it's Cartoonerific, yeah! Hello, this is Brian Mitchell. Welcome to the Cartoonerific Classic Animated Cartoon Podcast. I'm your host. Well, we're veering a little bit off course today. Uh, and the reason why is because um, there's been a recent development uh, where HBO Max took off half the Looney Tunes off their streaming service. And I know a lot of people are upset about it. It's not just people in the cartoon community. There are many other people that love those cartoons, but they're not diehard fans, but they love those cartoons. And, and so there's a lot of people up in arms. I've seen a lot of articles uh, about this. And uh, I just wanted to also kind of chime in. I'm not in the, uh, in the uh, mode of, uh, of, being negative on any particular company. Every company makes decisions for their own reasons, and I understand that. But to me, the promise of streaming was the fact that you could subscribe to a service and have access to just about any title in their library at any time that you wanted to view it. Uh, that was the magic of it. That was the promise of it. Uh, it seems like these services are not living up to that. And I think they're uh, pulling back on some of these titles, not because of uh, they don't like them or whatever, but I think because they're favoring newer content, uh, new movies kind of get the eyeballs uh, on the screen there. And it's the same thing with uh, things that are being produced expressly for streaming. And so that's where they kind of going with their focus. But I think with uh, properties like the classic Looney Tunes characters, which are, in my mind, evergreen, uh, you have people out there that haven't seen them. There are many people that have seen them and enjoy them. And it kind of fuels the merchandising for uh, any company, you know, for Warner Brothers, it should be fueling the merchandising there. But I just feel that there's been uh, a, a lack of attention to the Looney Tunes. They're still very, very popular. Uh, and all they have to do is just keep it out there in some form. But anyway, um, I noticed with Disney Plus and years ago, and we're only going back maybe a little bit over three years ago, when it was rolled out, uh, I, I got some sort of a, a three-year deal on the subscription. So I uh, subscribed, but it was only because there was a promise uh, from the Disney company that eventually uh, the entire library would be rolled out onto the streaming service in a year. Well, honestly, that never happened. Uh, there are many titles that are not on there. A lot of them are cartoons. Uh, obviously, songs like, uh, obviously films like Song of the South uh, were not put on the service, which is understandable. Um, but there are many other films there that have not been made available. And I was hoping for a lot of the D uh, Disney TV show content because they, uh, 
produced a lot of animation for the TV shows, which were compilation shows. Uh, and uh, some of the original shows were Walt Disney, which, you know, they had about 10 years worth of material there for that. Um, that A lot of that stuff has not appeared, you know, only some here and there that they would put on the on the streaming channel. So it's been a real disappointment there uh, that they have not made their entire library available. And uh, going through it, I, 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 you know, we were talking about uh, one particular film that I said uh, on a, a past podcast that, oh, you can probably watch this on Disney+. Plus. Well, that film was not made available. I, I don't remember which film it was, but I went to check and it wasn't. Uh, which I was surprised because Disney basically controls the rights to that film. With all this that has gone down, I just feel like we, we should talk about, at least right now, the uh, um, uh, HBO Max uh, decision to pull half the Looney Tunes off. And I figured we'd have uh, somebody on that could talk about the Looney Tunes. And uh, there's this gentleman, he is a Warner Brothers super fan. He's basically seen every... Looney Tunes, Merry Melodies cartoon from 1930 to 1969. And he is very knowledgeable about the directors who directed what. And, and I figured we'd have him on today to talk a little bit about that, and a little bit about the HBO Max and, and just uh, maybe toss, talk about the missed opportunities by not having these cartoons more in the public eye. So uh, his name is Chase Pritchard. And he's going to be on next. Don't go away. Cartoonerific is the place to be to celebrate hand-drawn animated cartoons. The Cartoonerific podcast features interviews with the magic makers behind your favorite animated cartoons with episodes uploaded every Friday. Or visit the Cartoonerific blog featuring articles about classic cartoon animation. At the Cartoonerific Gallery, view original animation art and memorabilia from your favorite animated films and TV shows. The company store features exclusive swag from the Cartoonerific universe. And coming soon, brand new world premiere cartoons on the Cartoonerific channel. It's all here. Join the fun at www.cartoonerific.com. That's cartoon, E-R-I-F-I-C.com. It's Cartoonerific. Saving the universe one funny cartoon at a time. And now it's time for our special cartoonerific guest. Well, well, well. Well, today we're going to be talking about the classic Looney Tunes from 1930 to 1969. Uh, originally, when these things started out, they were uh, being uh, produced by Harmon and Ising, who originally came from the Disney studio left there and they were courted over to Warner Brothers to do some cartoons and eventually they were kind of booted out or left however way you want to look at it but uh, eventually became the the people like uh, Frizz Freeling who was kind of a holdover and then he had uh, Tex Avery and Chuck Jones and Bob Clampett and Frank Tashlin and and uh, Bob McKimson Art Davis a lot, of, a lot of these people that were uh actually directing the cartoons and, and doing a wonderful job. But um, recently, uh, HBO Max uh, decided that they're going to ax half their Looney Tunes library that was on their streaming service. And a lot of people are pretty angry about it uh, or frustrated by it because, uh, you know, I, I know with me, you know, I, uh, I basically uh, uh, subscribe to Disney Plus and Disney Plus has, they promised that they were going to have all this material on there. And uh, there's still a lot of missing material. But HBO Max had the material on there and basically just pulled it. It's basically all the 1950s uh, Warner Brothers classics like uh, What's Up or Doc and Rabbit Seasoning and uh, One Froggy Evening. And you know, I can go on and on and on. But anyway, our guest today is... Uh, uh, a Warner Brothers uh, classic cartoon super fan, and I, I consider him an expert. Uh, he's uh, posted a lot of stuff online that's uh, uh, pretty neat, and uh, so he decided to have him on and talk about all these Looney Tunes cartoons. So please welcome Chase Pritchard. Hi, Chase. How you doing? Start talking. It's your nickel. There you go. <laughs> I have been talking. I do talk a lot, don't I? So did I pronounce your last name right? Yeah. It's Pritchard, right? Yeah, it's it, it's Pritchard. I, some, okay. some people, 
maybe somewhat confused, like trying to get it. But yeah, you, you got it, my man. He got it. There you go. How'd you become such a uh, cartoon fanatic? Uh, yeah. Because, Ooh. Because you, you, like, you, you like you like you like what what are your favorite cartoon studios anyway? I know it's Warner Brothers. Uh oh oh, Ride Rage. Of, of course, the Warner Brothers cartoons are like the ones that are like a go to for me personally. But I usually like let's see, Disney is like another one I like to talk about. Uh oh, MGM is like is definitely a fave, especially with Tex Avery and the Best of Tom and Jerry's. Uh, for a couple of quote unquote obscures. Uh. Just once in a while, you you will find a good Columbia cartoon. Like UPA did did a couple of gems. Uh, Walter right. Lance, of course, did some excellent Woody Woodpecker cartoons and even some Andy Panic cartoons. Uh, mm-hmm. Fletcher's, of course, I love Popeye. Pretty much considered them, made some of the best 1930s cartoons. Uh, maybe like a number of the famous studios ones that uh, came after the whole th- thing with Fletcher's kind of like died down. So. I would I would say I'm like a general well rounded like individual that that likes the old cartoon studios, but Warner Brothers is kind of like a particular favorite since that's kind of like where initially my love for classic animation really got started. So, so anything you want to say before I get gritty with my organs? <laughs> I could, I could say a lot of things. Uh, no, I I think Warner Brothers was out there. You know, I'm I'm from New York and I grew up in New York and we had. During the day, we had the, I think it was the pre-40, I want to say pre-49 Warner Brothers Library, which was sold to television. Yeah, from my uh, understanding, it's yeah. 1948. Yeah, there you go. So thank you for correction. So you mm-hmm. see, I, that's why you're on here. See, so Indeed. Uh, but yeah, we had all that. And then to get the newer stuff, it was basically the the Bugs Bunny show, which was on... I think it was CBS at the time. CBS or A. I don't think it was ever on ABC. I think it was CBS. It was ABC originally, then it was on CBS for a long time, from my understanding. There you go. Okay. So I'm being correct. See, I don't know everything. I don't know everything. And it's great. It's great that you're on here. So there we go. So that's yeah, that's why that's why you before. that's why you are a guest on here, sir. So indeed. So uh yeah, so you know, I so I grew up on uh watching this stuff. On TV, and I got the well-rounded uh, Warner Brothers cartoons knowledge, and uh, you know, just from watching one cartoon after another, and I've seen these things multiple times. Anyway, uh, how do you feel about this whole HBO Max thing with uh, pulling off half the cartoons, uh, pretty much the 1950s ones? Put it one way: annoyed, but not mad. You. <laughs> I'm I'm uh I'm not angry about it. I just I I feel very frustrated uh by it because you know like I said uh in the intro here that Disney uh when they originally started up their streaming service said that they were going to put the whole library out and they said it would all be on uh Disney Plus in a year and it's over 3 years now and not everything is out there. And uh, I understand them holding back a couple of different things, but basically uh, the the cartoons, you know, the, not every not everything has been put on there. I mean, there's a lot of stuff missing and it's and yeah, it's, there's it's, it's still a lot bad. more to go. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot more to go. And I, I'm and I kind of fear that they'll never put it out there, you know, because it's not like uh, yeah. there's certain shorts over there like, uh, you know, the truth about Mother Goose, which I don't even th- I don't think it's on the service. Uh, it's a great, great uh, featurette, but it, it it will probably never make its way to the service. And even though I'm sure they've cleaned it up and could make it available, but they don't. So with the Warner Brothers uh, uh, HBO Max basically pulling half the Looney Tunes off of there, uh, I just feel like uh, they're doing themselves a real disservice because those cartoons are evergreen and you know, if they really put them on there, it had us, you know, almost create a show for it, like maybe a new Bugs Bunny show with new interstitial material or whatever. Oh, that'd frame be it wonderful. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's some great animators out there that can really do wonderful Bugs Bunny stuff and um, or even use the old stuff if they could find it. You know, uh, I think, uh, you know, they could be uh, doing themselves a big favor. And people would be watching it, I think. 
Yeah. Totally the, the impression I get, like, honestly, from my perspective, I'm surprised at how big this all blew up. Like, I know people love these cartoons dearly, but when the story initially, like, came about, and, like, in my little circles, we just figured, oh, this is Warner Bros. being Warner Bros. again with these cartoon characters, like, treating them like they, they could do whatever with these cartoon characters, and nothing would really amount to anything. Maybe some people online would, like, throw a fuse or, like, do something about it, but to... To our shock, like it went to variety, like it got legitimized, and it made me go, "Oh, okay, this is this is a little bit different." Uh, oh, oh dear. <laughs> well, I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna bring up something here which uh, I thought was kind of interesting, and um, I, I think uh, Warner Brothers is, and, and I, I try not to be too critical on these shows. I try to keep it light, but I think in this case, I think I think it's worth pointing this out. Um, there was an article in, well, okay. There are two things. There's, uh, one thing in 2022, I believe there was an article. I don't know if this was in Forbes magazine. Actually, it may not have been, it may be in, um, trying to think the, what the magazine was. Oh God. Anyway, they were talking about adults and, uh, buying toys and, uh, one fourth of the audience for like cartoon characters and the uh, merchandisable stuff like, you know, star Wars and stuff like that. They bought about $9 billion worth of toys in 2022, uh, which I thought was unbelievable. Uh, $9 billion of toys that adults bought and they called them kid adults. <laughs> oh boy. That whole thing. Yeah. So, uh, that that was that was kind of interesting. One fourth of all to toy sales went to adults, not adults buying for kids, yeah. just to adults. So um, that sounds about right. Yeah, and uh, so uh, the reason why I bring that up is because a lot of people, a lot of adults, have grown up on the Looney Tunes stuff, and those people are are definitely watching some of those, you know, those cartoons. Um, oh, yeah, they are. I've, I've, I've seen them. They've, they've been talking about it. Like, every, like the day MTV, like, started airing the shorts, it was considered, like, a big deal, even to those of us who are, like, really not in the know. Like, it's like, oh, finally, these cartoons finally have a home somewhere. Right, right. Well, okay, so here's the other thing. So in 2011... Now this has changed because now Star Star Wars you got the Mandalorian you know you got uh, mm -hmm. all these all these incarnations of uh, Marvel characters so this has changed all right um, but in 2011 Forbes uh, rated the top 20 cartoon characters of all time uh, for merchandising and how much they made and who do you think was on top as far as the top company out of you know all these these 20 different properties i take a guess mm. what is it pair about <laughs> you're fun in me i know you're fun in me who do you think it was it was disney disney oh, yeah. and uh disney had let's see uh disney princesses was uh 1.6 billion dollars Star Wars was 1.5 billion. Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, 1.1 billion. Cars, 1.05 billion. Uh, Mickey came in number six at 750 million. Uh, let's see. I, I think uh, they clumped that in. It's Mickey and his pals, right? Um, yeah. Toy yeah, Story. For our observation, they do clump it together. Yeah. Toy Story number eight. Uh, Peanuts was number nine, uh, mm. which is amazing because it's just like, you know, there's no comic strip anymore unless it's classic <laughs> Peanuts. And it's basically a couple of specials or an old movie or something like that that they did. But Sesame Street the Christmas special. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So uh, Sesame Street was 10. Disney Fairies was 11. Thomas the Tank Engine, 12. Garfield was 13. Gar Garfield's always been big. 14 was Dora the Explorer, 15 SpongeBob, 16 Spider-Man, which is Disney, 
Uh, 17 was Ben 10 from Cartoon Network. 18, Angry Birds. 19, Batman. That's a Warner property. And 20, Barbie. Nowhere on that list is Looney Tunes, which I think is a, uh, crazy because uh, back in the day, Looney Tunes merchandising was certainly up there and through the roof. And I wish I had something from the uh, 70s to compare it to or the 60s. Um, you know, Disney was Disney always merchandised this stuff really well. But for Disney to have, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, six properties in the top 10 um, wh where they're generating billions of dollars and Disney fairies coming in at 11 uh, and Spider-Man at 16. And this, this has definitely grown now because the Avengers and all that other stuff is all, all the way up at the top of the list. But Warner's at that time was at the bottom rung. It was basically number 17 and then Batman was number 19, which goes to show that, you know, they're, they're not merchandising the characters right, I think. But I also believe that they're not showcasing their characters as well as they could. And for the Looney Tunes not to be on that top 20 list is mind boggling to me. Uh, I don't know how you feel about that, but it's, uh, you know, it's certainly very telling, like to me, like I, of course the, um, not necessarily understanding, but like connect, like Batman, like, like honestly, look, look at back on the list. I'm surprised Batman's on in the top 10, <laughs> like to be honest with you. Cause nowadays it, it feels like Batman's like the, the Warner Bros property that like they, that's most beloved. Like, in fact, if anything, <laughs> I'm surprised Scooby Doo's not on there. Right. Some right. days it kind it kind of feels like some days it feels like Warner Bros. loves Scooby Doo more than the Looney Tunes nowadays. Well, when they program uh, Scooby Doo around the clock and they just ignore everything else, but yeah, I I just think that there is a a disconnect somewhere, and because all these cartoons, you know, it, it's funny. I I remember showing my my daughter. Uh, the classic, uh, like Tweety and Sylvester and Bugs Bunny and stuff. She absolutely loved it. She was glued to the TV, and there was no nobody was running them. Nobody was running them. I had to pull out a uh, one of the compilations. One of the, I think it was a DVD compilation of uh, all these different cartoons, and she absolutely loved it. There's material there for the adults, obviously, uh, but kids take to it right away, and. Uh, I don't. Oh, they do. They do. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I just think that something is not being done right. I think they're not realizing the value of the characters. That's the reason why I pointed this out with the merchandising, because when they're floundering like that, they should have at least been in the uh, in the top twenty, and they're just not. They're just not in there. Um, and Something is definitely going on on the marketing or how. However, Warner Brothers' mindset is to, to the Lily Tunes. Um, my understanding is, and my impression seems to be that at some point in the 2010s, and I was there and saw it, like, there, like, there was, Warner Brothers was interested in the Lily Tunes, but they really weren't interested in, like, their past in a certain way. They were more interested in, like, okay, uh, let's put them in a sitcom. Let's see how they do in a new cartoon for kids or Let's see how they do when they do this and this or that. And maybe sometimes that, that can work. And it, it definitely can't help them get involved in like in a new audience. Like I know for a fact the sitcom, which I mixed about, but I do know that like that show really helped put pe those characters on the map with like a certain generation. Like I've seen YouTube clips of it go reach in the millions, which the Looney Tunes show that they did, the new one or yeah, the the sitcom went back in 2010. Oh, okay. All right. So basically that's the one where they're just, there's no slapstick action. It's kind of, they're just living in houses and stuff like that. More, more or less. Yeah. 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 It's, that's kind of like, um, God, what was, you know, they had the, uh, I'm trying to think where they took like Tom and Jerry, right? You know, Tom and Jerry was just ba basically these two guys, just, uh, you know, one chasing the other and then the other one defending himself and, Basically, the character is getting bashed, you know, pretty much Tom most of the time. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so, you know, there are people at, uh, uh, just make this as a side point, you know, people point out, they say, oh, the violence. And it's not the violence that's funny. What's funny is yeah. the comeuppance, you know, that's what's funny. You know, you got one guy that's in, uh, you know, the 
the antagonist, and then you got the other one that basically kind of thwarts him, and yeah. and uh, it's the funny reactions to that happening. Funny is very important to it. Yeah, but I mean, but that's the that that's the whole point of it. It's but it, it's never it's it's the uh, indignity, and I find that with. Uh, Chuck Jones, uh, Roadrunners, or even the uh, Bugs and Daffy cartoons, or the same thing with Tweety and Sylvester, you know? It's the, you know, you get this guy, and he's going after this other character, and it's uh, and it's the, the fun you're having with the other character just kind of just showing them up, you know? So, yeah. yeah. For some of the conflict, like, uh, plot lines, the fun isn't necessarily, or the intrigue isn't really the fact of, oh, will they, will they or won't they get it? But the fun is really seeing, okay, how would they react in this certain situation? Like, say, oh, maybe Elmer Fudd will get a girlfriend bunny rabbit or something, and, and he needs, a, needs to get a rabbit suit or something, so he just gets Bugs Bunny a carrot, and then suddenly... The, the, like the the rap the two rabbits are together and all these comedic hijinks ensue and that's really like where the entry lies to someone like me for instance right what's your what's your favorite Looney Tune cartoons uh oh a couple uh we could go all day but I'll cite two of them my personal favorite is a Bugs Bunny cartoon directed by Frank Tashlin called The Unruly Hair but if you ask me like what is the quintessential Looney Tune Fast yeah. and Furious, the very first Road Warrior cartoon. The very first was, one, which almost looks like, you know, when I first saw that cartoon, well, maybe not the first time I saw it, maybe the 10th time I saw it, where I was really, you know, I was getting into Disney and all this stuff, and I looked at it, and it almost had a multiplane feel to it, because it, I don't know, it felt very dimensional to me. Um, yeah, the, oh, those backgrounds are so amazing. Yeah. Um, and those cartoons, I think, you know, there's something about the, the crudity of... Um, you know, even with the first Flintstones cartoons where the characters are, you know, they're not they're not as slick as they were like, you know, maybe three years after, two or three yeah. years later where all of us, you know, these characters are just really their the draftsmanship is like impeccable and stuff like that. And it's just, oh, those those yeah. first few episodes are beautiful looking and they're el cruelty elegance or however you say it. Yeah, they're they're they're, they're a little bit uh, uh, when I say crude, it's just like they're. Uh, uh, they're more org organic. Maybe I'll say it that way. You know, they're more yeah. organic looking. And I don't think the attention was to getting a really tight model on the character. They would go off and do different things with the the way they looked. And it, and I think they were funnier for that. No one here, Barbara. They just probably didn't have time to like nail it all down at first. Yeah. Well, I think when they got to like the early '60s, when they got into like. Uh, by the time they were doing like the Yogi Bear show when they got into the 1960 version or whatever, you know, it, it was all kind of locked down. They, you know, they would design the characters and then they lock that character down and it would be slick. It had a slick look to it, especially with the hand ink line. I, I find that with like the early Warner Brothers cartoons and basically they ended up becoming refined. But then, you know, they're, you know, in one way they get better, you know, they, they got better with the character expressions, but and in some ways it, it wasn't better. And uh, they there lost that looseness. There definitely is a difference with the Rock Rider Coyote, yeah. Yeah. And I, I do like the first one, Fast and Furious, right? Uh, when was yeah. that When was that made? It was, it was in the 40s, uh, in 1940. It was made in 1947, came yeah. out in 1949. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I guess Warners was stockpiling a lot of these cartoons, right? Yeah, the there was there, there was a reason for that. The main one was that there was a technicolor storage at that time. Ah, uh, there you go. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a really great cartoon. Uh, a lot of fun to watch. Uh, Unruly Hair, I think, came out in the mid '40s somewhere, and I, I actually yeah, forty-five. You know, it's funny. I used to uh, when I was a kid. I used to we, we you couldn't get videotapes at that time. I'm really going back now. And uh, the only way that you could collect the cartoon was uh, they would have excerpts. Uh, I, back in the day, I guess in the 60s, Kenner made something called the Easy Show Projector, which Ooh. was a cartridge. And it would be, they would actually cut frames. They would, they cut frames from the cartoon. And instead of uh, projecting it at like a 24 frames per second, it was like uh, 18 frames. And so uh, you would put this thing in the projector and it would project it onto the screen. It would either be black and white or color or whatever. But you got this uh, truncated cartoon. But anyway, um, Unruly Hair, uh, when I acquired a 16 millimeter projector, which was uh, the medium that they used to use in schools 
to show films. Uh, I had, yeah, I remember those. Yeah. I had this really primitive, uh, <laughs> 16 millimeter projector and it looked like it was from the 1930s. Uh, and it was a, a giant heavy thing, but, uh, but I, I was able to acquire from somebody a black and white print of unruly hair. I, all I can remember was Bugs, uh, Bugs Bunny looked okay in it, but uh, Elmer Fudd looked kind of weird uh, compared to how everybody else was drawing Elmer Fudd. So, uh, right, yeah. But I remember it being a very funny cartoon. And, oh, it's a it's an extraordinarily funny cartoon. I think it's one of the funniest Bugs yeah, Bunny cartoons yeah. personally. Yeah. So, you know, Tashlin did some good stuff over there uh, at Warner Brothers until, you know, he eventually became a live action director and he directed. He uh, did. For, he, from my understanding, apparently Tashlin directed a lot of those cartoons thinking, oh, I'm going to be a live action director one day. And sure enough, he actually went and did it. Yeah. That's, it, you know, that's the uh, power of positive thinking, I guess, you know. Yeah. You kind of will yourself into a, a, a profession. But uh, yeah, he, he. What's funny is uh, I'm trying to think of what film. He, I think he did some Jerry Lewis films, and yeah, uh, he did. He did a couple. I yeah. artists and models is one of them. Hollywood or bust. Mm -hmm. Didn't he do the Aaron Boy? Was that one of them, or was that just uh, Jerry I think all Jerry by himself? Jerry did that himself, if okay. I remember right. And I think he also directed some Bob Hope vehicles too, didn't he? Yeah, Fantastic. Son of Paleface. What? A, yeah, a fantastic comedy. Yeah. So yeah, I, I kind of remember that. But anyway. He he went on to do that, but basically all the other guys kind of stuck around. They, I guess, they like cartoons. So they um, did. Yeah. Who's your favorite uh, Warner Brothers director? Is it Tashlin or very very hard question? Right now, my my heart's at with Chuck Jones. He was pretty much the first Yellow Tunes director I fell in love with, and he's he still tops in my books. I you know I, if I had to put him in order, somebody you know somebody on Facebook they put on who do you think was the 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 best. Uh, Warner Brothers director, and I was like, "Well, you know, they're 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 all pretty darn good in their own way, you know." But uh, Chuck Jones for me is number one. Frizz is number two. Uh, uh, Clampett, I would say uh, Tashlin, and then McKimson. I put them in that order. Each director was doing like a, a you know like eleven, ten or eleven cartoons per year. Uh, and so you, you know that for bugs, it was like eight and Chuck would have to do like three of them of the bugs bunnies. Yes. Yeah. But, but they were, ba but each director was doing about 10 cartoons a year or something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I think that's correct. So, so anyway, yeah, they, so their, their schedule is about 30 and then you had, uh, it was just basically one unit. It was the Tom and Jerry unit. So, you know, they were producing the cartoons. I don't think, I, I don't think they were doing them in five weeks. I think it was taking them a little bit longer to do it. Um, and I don't, I you don't have that time. You know, schedules were a lot more relaxed compared to Warner Brothers. I know that for a fact. Yeah. I mean, I wish I, I could look at the Of Mice and Magic book and probably find that out but uh it's basically i know they had a longer production schedule so basically maybe they were producing you know six to eight cartoons a year on the tom and juries you know and then maybe the tech savories yeah the tech savories kind of flushed them out a little bit so it gave them maybe you know 12 or 13 cartoons a year maybe something like that i don't I know said the money was better at mgm i pretty sure we said that uh i guess the way they looked at it was you know utmost quality so mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you consider the the best years of output for the studio? Um because Ooh, good question. The uh I was definitely yeah. thinking about this. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you go. I'm definitely you know, you start seeing the cracks even when they were on their last legs, you know. Uh yeah, in the were, early sixties because uh they were winding it down they, they came a point where they're just gonna close the studio in 1963 I'll try not to dwell on those 60s shorts too much because although there's some really good ones like you could definitely tell that like i don't know if it's because of fatigue of the age or whatnot but you could definitely sense there's a difference from a lot of those 60s warner bros cartoons compared to the 40s ones or even from the 50s i think some of it has to do with the budgeting um, and, oh, yes, yes. Uh, that, and there's, that's there's very much a factor. Well, there's, there's, there's a couple of issues that were going on there. And, uh, 
you know, the uh, Hanna-Barbera had come into existence and they, they were just basically hiring everybody and they were offering a lot more money than other studios. So, you know, you had, uh, because there, w there wasn't a whole lot in town, you know, Walter Lance was still going on, but MGM had shut down. Um, trying, to, trying to think here, Disney shut down their short department and they yeah, were even, yeah. and after Sleeping Beauty came the big layoff. They, they let a, a oh, ton yeah, of people go. So, you know, where did those people go to? You know, they went to television. Yeah, Hanna-Barbera, other studios, they, they all just sc scatter about pretty much. Yeah. And the thing is, is that, you know, at that time, you know, Hanna-Barbera was looking for good story people because it was just, uh, you know, it, it literally was a machine that mm -hmm. was just uh, chewing up chewing up talent like crazy. So, you know, Michael Maltese left, Warren Foster, Fo excuse me, Warren Foster, uh, who were two top storymen at uh, Warner's, and then they ended up leaving and going over to Hanna-Barbera. And so... Yeah, apparently the story goes was that Billy Hanna apparently went, okay, setting aside our egos, who are the, who are the funniest writers in, in cartoons? And... Well, Warner Brothers got, had them, so let's let's call up Mike Maltese to see how he's doing. And from my understanding, Warren Foster actually left beforehand to work for John Sutherland, and then apparently he got the offer from Hanna Barbera, which definitely makes one curious on why Warren wanted to jump ship. Maybe it was because of you know budgets or whatnot. It's certainly interesting to ponder. Well, I think I you know Warner Warner Brothers just ended up at this point where. Uh, and I mean, they were always kind of like this. They they paid okay. Uh, they were not, you know, the. I mean, if you went to Disney, you made, you made more money generally. Um, but Warner Brothers, you know, you made a decent salary, but you you weren't getting rich. And I think with uh, uh, people like uh, Michael Maltese, when they found out what they could make over at, uh, uh, you know, Hanna, Hanna Barbera. It was kind of like it was a no-brainer. You know, they'd done all these shorts. It's like, okay, it's time to cash in, you know. And I think that's what, I, I believe that's what happened. Um, and the person who was filling in, fortunately for Warners, they had a um, a good guy come up named John Dunn. Oh, John Dunn. Oh, he's he's a good one. Yeah. And John Dunn uh, basically was writing for everybody at that point. I mean, I'm yeah, sure there were... Yeah, the units. I'm, yeah. So... I don't want to say it went uh, downhill because of that, but I think uh, just the idea, you know, they're probably pulling back on the budgets and, uh, you know, you, you got you to gotta do this stuff faster. I'm sure there was pressure on them to do that. Yeah, because, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, so I think a lot of stuff. But, you know, the, the soundtracks were still lush and uh, the cartoons were still inventive. Frizz did a cartoon called... Uh, uh, Art, Art Lee and Artie, I uh, believe, animated on it. it was uh, Honey's Money or... or think, oh, Honey's Money. Oh, that's a good one. And it's a, it's a, a remake of His Bitter Half, but it still works. It That, that plot line works great for a character like Sam. Yeah. And uh, Chuck did High Note, and he still was doing some good uh, Roadrunners, you know? So... Yeah, there's... To be or not to be, yeah. Yeah. So there was a lot of good stuff, and then they did a a film called, I think it was The Adventures of the Roadrunner, which was basically uh, two kids yeah, watching the TV. Yeah, minute pilot. Yeah. And it's actually, you know, I I watched it, I th I believe it's on one of the compilation um Yeah, uh, go to DVDs. Collection Volume 2. Yeah. It's, uh, it's actually fun. I mean, I know it, and it plays a whole lot better than the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner movie, where they basically did the same thing for like the la last half hour of that movie. Um but I think it just plays better in that in that format the way they did it, and so yeah, they let the short they let the shorts of the new material breathe in it. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, there's good stuff. Anyway, getting back to the best period, I think if I had to pick a time frame for Warner Brothers, uh, their best shorts. I would say, and I'm not going to go directly to the decade. I would say probably 1946 to 1956, uh, and, and yeah, made, those are some good years. Yeah, and I mean, there's still there were still great shorts that were done the year after that, and mm -hmm. uh, and so you know, I know I know that's, but I think the 
bulk of it, you know, the, the best Pepe Le Pews and the best Roadrunners and Bugs Bunny cartoons, uh, I think they were done during that time. And yeah, so, mostly pre-strike. Yeah, I, I don't blame you. I, I I mostly agree for the most part. Yeah. So uh, me, me yeah. personally, um, to me, I would say the peak of the studio is like 1942 to 1946. But in a broader stroke, I would say that like the golden age of like, or if you want to recommend to someone who has never seen a Louis Tune or where they should start or where they golden ages i would say it would start roughly from when tex avery decided to leave which was around like 1941 1942 and roughly mm -hmm. about 1958 to 1960 when mike Maltese left right and then like i said excuse me there's still there was still good stuff being done um because you had you still had some good talents there but you know eventually was, yes but eventually, some of these people are getting, you know, I, I believe Jones was fired because he was moonlighting on the UPA thing, uh, Gay Parry. Yeah, the Gay Parry thing. Yeah, and I heard he was he was let go. And I, so it was because of that. <laughs> there's a story yeah. There's a story that uh, I don't think I've told, which um, I, I worked on um, Animaniacs, and uh, one of the... One of our guys left to head up the new Pink Panther show. Ooh, I think this might be new to me. Let's hear it. <laughs> and so, uh, well, the way the story, I might have said this on a previous podcast, but what ended up happening was uh, uh, the person who left was producing the show. And so they needed people. And so he was calling everybody back, <laughs> calling everybody at Warner Brothers uh, to try to get them a freelance on the show. Uh, and so I, I was one of the people called. and uh, But uh, I, I thought I was one of the few people called, but apparently everybody was called. And uh, <laughs> so one day we, we were uh, all, a, a lot of us were in an office, I'd say about 10 or 12 of us. And, uh, and all of a sudden, the executive producer of Warner Brothers Cartoons comes in. And he said, I just want to congratulate everybody for doing such a great job on the new, the new Pink Panther show. And uh, when I had worked, when I had worked, I only worked on like one episode or maybe maybe two cartoons. I don't know. But the uh, I asked I asked them, please do not put my name on it. And uh, they said, well, we have to put some credit on there. And. Uh, I said, uh, so I made up some name and, <laughs> and I had done that a few times. Uh, there's a, in the Disney encyclopedia, the Disney encyclopedia of Disney TV by Bill Cotter. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I had worked on the Schnookums and Meat funny cartoon show. And, oh boy. Uh, and uh, so that was a Bill Cop, Jeff DeGrandis thing. And I, once again, I was freelance on it, and I asked them, "Well, just uh, yeah, just put my, you know, put the the name. What the name was Belto Clark." Oh. And so anyway, the the credit actually appears in the book, you know, under the Schnuckums Meet Funny Cartoon Show. But I think also they put my name in the show as well. So the I'm like credited twice. Uh, but anyway. Uh, what they did a curiosity, at, Brian, uh, yeah. was that common during the nineties? Because I know for a fact that for chariots of fur, a lot of Disney animators actually animated on that for Chuck. They just wanted to work for Chuck. And because right. there was like a Disney thing going, like they just used fake, fake names for that. I, I, I don't know if that's true, but I, I, but I could tell you there's a lot of Disney fans, uh, or a lot of Disney animators that are Chuck Jones fans. And I mean, if you haven't figured it out yet, you know, like Eric Goldberg is one of those guys. I don't know if he animated on the on those shorts, and uh, but he yeah, I animated on chariots. I know that he admitted that. Oh, oh, okay. Well, if he admitted it, I'm I'm not going to out anybody on that. But you know, if you really like if you really like something, then you end up uh, working on. You know, I grew up on Casper the Friendly Ghost, uh, which was a famous studio thing. Back in yeah, the, yeah. you know, and they were producing them from the 40s and the 50s and 60s, you know. And uh, 
so, you know, in my very young years, you know, I'd say like, you know, three years old, four or five years old, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. I love the character Casper the Friendly Ghost. But I ended up working uh, years later on the spooktacular adventures of Casper, and I did a lot of shows as a storyboard artist. It was a little surreal to me because it was, you know, it's something I grew up on, and here I am in my adult years, and I'm working on the new version of it. So I just thought it was uh, kind of weird, you know. But anyway, uh, just getting back to that story. Yeah, we were all congratulated because they put our name on every single show. So if you worked on one show, they call it like a gang credit, your name uh -huh. would appear. They would just put all the names of everybody that worked on. We I don't know if they did 65 episodes of this thing, but my name appeared on every single episode of that show. Um, so it's, uh, a little bizarre and I only worked on like one or two cartoons. So there you go. That, you know, stuff like that happens, but yeah, gotcha, I would say, gotcha. but, but getting back to the, uh, you know, yeah, if you're a big fan of somebody, Chuck Jones or even Snoopy and, you know, just, just for the hell of it, you want to be able to say, oh yeah, I worked on that, you know, in case somebody asks you, oh yeah, I animated a few scenes on that, you know? And so it's kind of a, you know, it's just kind of a neat thing. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, why, why not do it? Yeah. Why not do it? Yeah. They're paying you to do it. So, you know, and sometimes they get really good work out of you because you're just, uh, you're so in love with that stuff. You have anything to say about the Looney Tunes? What do you, Ooh, I, I, I could go all, all day for like any of them. Um, well, for one example, uh, I we should probably bring up like Tex Avery, for example. Like I know everyone likes to praise his uh, MGM cartoons, but I would definitely want to shout out a couple of his Warner Bros. cartoons because uh, some of them like hold up beautifully in my mind. Like for example, some of the Bugs Bunnies, like the Heckling Hair or Toys Beats Hair, I think are like an excellent like groundwork for like where to take Bugs or that the art directors kind of like built upon and kind of did their own take on and. And I think even Chuck would agree that, like, that's where Bugs came from. It pretty much came from Tex. Yeah. Well, I think there were so many people involved with that. You know, everybody took credit for right. what they did, I you know. know what you mean. Uh, there were, but there was a thing uh, around for a while that it's like, you know, whoever you talk to, you know, if you're talking to Frizz, oh, yeah, you know, I, I think Frizz, Frizz was a little bit more modest, you know. I think Chuck took a lot of credit for the stuff that he really did create, which uh, the Roadrunner and uh, uh, Pepe Le Pew. And, you know, he had a whole different approach with Bugs, I think, than uh, and Daffy oh, Duck. Because Daffy and other people's hands was just crazy. It's just crazy duck, you know? And then when you, when uh, I guess Chuck started making him kind of this frustrated character, you know, uh, Especially, especially in regards to Bugs Bunny, because Bugs was basically cool and collected, and then you had uh, Daffy Duck opposite him. And I just remember one uh, Chuck Jones cartoon where Daffy is actually kind of Daffy at the beginning beginning of it. He's really kind of, uh, you know, he's he's like, uh, you know, he's putting uh, rabbit tracks down, and he's like, uh, and, and one of the comments he says is like. Uh, yeah, I'm just doing it because it's kind of fun, you know? Ah, rabbit seasoning. Yeah. And so it opens up with a real Daffy, Daffy Duck. And then through the cartoon, he gets really kind of frustrated uh, with Bugs Bunny, you know, because he's getting his head uh, blown I, off. I, yeah. I've, I've never noticed that, but but you're right. That's, it's definitely a bit different from, say, Rabbit Fire, where, like, right away, like, the Chuck Jones version of uh, Daffy got established right away, and... Yeah. One thing I want to I, I want to point out about that before we really get going with that conversation is what I've always found interesting is that I think Frizz really should get some credit for that because really I think Frizz kind of like set the groundwork for that. Uh, do you remember the cartoon "You Ought to Be in Pictures"? Yes. Yes. Like that's that's where the egotistical Daffy like really got started. I would say like Frizz kind of like set the groundwork for that character like in that particular cartoon, which I'm surprised not a lot of people talk about. It's a fantastic cartoon. I, you know, I have to, that's the one where they, they incorporate the live action and it has it Michael, did, Mal, yes. Michael Maltese and uh, Leon Schlesinger. As, as the cop, yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's kind of interesting. There's another one called the Scarlet Pumpernickel, which came a oh, little bit later. A great one. 
And uh, it, it's another one. I, I think Frizz and um, I think they all kind of got together. I guess they're all kind of like delving into Daffy's personality a bit. Um, but somewhere, I guess in the early 50s, it really kind of, they gelled that down to he's just this frustrated character, you know. And they carried it on to Showbiz Bugs, you know, which was a, a Frizz Freeling cartoon, right? The impression that I get is that both Frizz and Chuck really pushed for that while the kids had had a, well, okay, I'll, I'll do what you guys say. And then maybe once in a while a story man like Ted Pierce will go, hey, I want to, I want Daffy to be a salesman or, oh, I want him to face off Elmer Fudd like like in the old days. And then McKiss will go, yeah, sure, go ahead. And right. Which is definitely different from how Chuck or Frizz would do it where they would try to push their, their specific versions of Daffy and try to get him in conflicts that would – kind of push that ego and frustration out of him, which, you know, is great comedy. Right. I also think that they were learning when they were uh, doing these cartoons because they, you know, when, you know, okay, you had Elmer Fudd and he would get a little frustrated, but he was dopey, you know, but then you had Yosemite Sam, which was basically uh, a, a caricature of Frizz, really. Yeah, um, I think you would frizz a minute at that. <laughs> and uh, and they found something that really worked with Yosemite Sam, basically, you know, being this this rough and tumble guy and always getting uh, getting his ass uh, kicked. Yeah, <laughs> Riz really should get some credit for like establishing Sam like right away in that first short hair trigger, like. It's shocking. That's his first. Like right away, like Frizz, Mike Maltese just like nailed that character right from the get go. And man, I, I'm sure you know this from working at cartoons, but trying to nail a character down like first go is not easy. Like it's a process. I think if you, uh, I think if you think funny, I think if you have a head, a good head on your shoulders, and you're thinking about if you can really delve into the humor of the characters. And, and this is this is the magic of the Looney Tunes is uh, those ca those cartoon characters are not just, you know, paintings on moving around on a screen. They are personalities. Yeah. And when you get that frustration with Yosemite Sam, with this wonderful, um, wonderful voices by Mel Blanc doing those things, you know, you get those good characterizations coming through on the, the audio yeah. and then. You're uh, reinforcing it with this beautiful uh, character animation yeah. on the screen. Uh, there's there's something that just becomes bigger than those those elements, you know. Uh, yeah, the thing that always keeps me coming back to them is just you feel like you're you're witnessing like human beings just like holding their dukes out of each other to try to like essentially to self expression in a weird sort of f funny way, like. Yeah, to you. Me, I, I, they're they're just about as real as like the people next door to you or whatever. Well, well, that's the magic of animation when you forget their drawings. You know, that's the magic of it. It's you know you're you're watching these personalities come to life on the screen, uh, these characters that never existed, and they're basically it's basically out of people's imaginations that they materialize. Uh, that's that's the fun and that that's the magic and that's that's why these cartoons are so wonderful. And they should be shown. They should be shown on HBO Max. They should, should be shown more. I'm surprised they're not, you know, CBS isn't showing. You know, uh, they should do, like I said before, a new Bugs Bunny show or a new Yeah, Tweety pretty much Sylvester the only show. hope now is that, um, like, Warner Bros. listens to the news that, like, everyone's talking about. And, like, I don't know, maybe they'll put them on, up on Tubi or um, Pluto or something and just let, let them air on those free-to-play channels and just let them grow an audience that or, organically, but you you just never know with Warner Bros. They they will be dead set on one thing, and then like the next year they're they're suddenly they suddenly one eighty on you. I'll t I'll tell you one thing. When I worked when I worked for Warner Brothers, we passed by you know the Warner Brothers Animation Studio was not on the studio lot. We were actually over by the Sherman Oaks Galleria, which was about eight miles away. But you would drive past the sound stages, and they had. Most of the time, they had all the cartoon characters painted on the side of the soundstage. You'd, you'd drive on Pass Avenue, and you would you would see these things. And it was like, um, I think they really appreciated the cartoon. Uh, whoever was there at the time, I think it was Bob Daly. 
but they appreciated the cartoons because, like I said before, you know, these things are evergreen. Um, you can't, you really can't own like a Humphrey Bogart. Those characters never get old. You know, they the don't. cartoons have a freshness to them. And they truly own these characters. They don't have to pay anybody for them. They own them. It's like the DC universe. They own it. And if they did the right things with them, they would be generating the merchandising. They'd be paying for themselves. It doesn't cost them to put these cartoons on the air. The only thing it costs them is uh, maybe to transfer them onto onto a, a different medium or maybe to clean them up. That may cost them some money. I think, uh, they've, I think they've been all cleaned up, but all they have to do is just air them. A lot of them have been, yeah. Yeah, and it's a, it's a, it's basically a, a I, want, I want to say it's a money machine, but it, it, it is. It's a money machine, you know? So yeah, it's, why not take advantage of a, what you got? Unfortunately, with Warner Brothers. Unfortunately, it's like a hype rope sort of thing with, like, Warner Brothers. Like, you, you want them to, like, realize, like, the potential of these characters and want them to do something, like, extraordinary with them and make, make them realize on how much audiences love them. I mean... Just take a look at the Bugs Bunny symphonies going on. Like, apparently, they're still sold out, like, decades later, which I'm very happy to hear about. Sure. But it's like, it's it's it, it's it's not easy. And I'm sure people who worked on the uh, Ladies Looney Tunes show, like, it, it probably wasn't easy to, like, figure out, like, new ways to, like, make these characters funny for a new audience that probably either were aware of the history or they liked the characters or, but not necessarily like deep in the lore, like some, some of, some of us are into. Right. Well, I mean, how many times can you make a, a space jam sequel to, <laughs> to bring, and I don't even know if these things really, uh, I'm not enthused with the sequels because I just, or, or the space jam. Some people may really like it. I just think oh, that either. I, I don't like it. Yeah. I just think it takes the characters out of their element which is uh, the way you want to see them, the way they're most enjoyable are as six-minute cartoons. That's the way they were designed to be. And, I you know, agree. and I just think, like, you know, putting them in a sitcom-y kind of thing, it's like you're not really, you're not really embracing what, what those characters are because you're, you know, you're trying to change them. You're constantly trying to change it. And uh, I just don't think that's the way to go, but... Hey, you know, I'm just an old timer here, you know. But. Yeah, and I'm just a I'm just a new timer that's still trying to find his footing, pretty much. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, but you do appreciate the old the old cartoons. So. I do. Yeah, like yeah. it. It definitely. I wouldn't say necessarily frustrating to know that like people mostly know the Looney Tunes nowadays from like Space Jam or whatever. But you know, that's just that's just the the, the reality with these characters and the visibility that Warner Brothers wants to few them as like I just I just wonder where it's going to go from here I just hope that they come to their senses with uh, the way they're presenting these cartoons maybe maybe they need somebody in there uh, to kind of really change up how they're thinking about the the animation division I don't know I hope I hope they rethink it I hope they come up with a strategy to revitalize these characters uh, and that would mean getting them back out in the public or maybe are they afraid to? Are they afraid to? Maybe they're just, uh, you know, maybe they're... T- I'm not uh, sure if afraid is the word that I would use. It's probably more reluctance. I just think the char- you know, I, the character is getting lost. I think the, pre- the appreciation isn't there like it used to be. And I think uh, that's part, part of their doing or, or basically not doing. And I think that's, you know, they, they, have, to, they have to get back to realizing the value of those classic cartoons. So I think, I I, I think, I think Disney has, I think Disney has kind of realized uh, to a certain point, but they still have not embraced all the, all the cartoons that they've done over the years and, and pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, well, anyway, that's my, uh, that's my big uh, negative uh, uh, rant on all this. So anyway, Chase, thanks for coming on the show here. I appreciate it. And, you uh, bet it, it was a, it was a lot of fun. Are you you said that you're writing some sort of a book on uh, Looney Tunes? I am. Tunes. Uh, basically, me and a friend. Uh, I'm not sure if I should say his name, but for right now, I, I probably won't. Uh, we're kind of working on a book. We're essentially doing what Jerry Beck did with his 100 Looney Tunes book, but we're kind of doing our own take on it. Where I would like um, 
take uh 100 Looney Tunes cartoons that I really love, and I would essentially kind of like talk my way through the cartoons to my friend who hasn't really seen them, and kind of like do my best to not necessarily sell sell the cartoons, but analyze them and kind of talk about the cartoons and why they matter, why the director should should matter, and what makes them um, something something to to analyze and. The book is actually going pretty well, and if things go well, I'm hoping that uh, it'll come out sometime later this year. Okay, pretty cool. Well, we'll keep track of that. You'll just let me know what's going on with it. I'm sure. Uh, you bet. Sure, I will. I'm sure, you let me know. So, anyway, fun conversation about Looney Tunes. Uh, so, anyway, For sure. Okay, so uh, let's see. From every director. Okay, so we know Chuck Jones is your favorite director. If you had to name favorite cartoon from each director for the Looney Tunes. Uh, Ooh, okay. Uh, okay. So Chuck let's start Jones. with Chuck Jones, favorite Looney Tunes cartoon. That's Fast and Furious, Frizz Freeling, Rhapsody of Ribbits, which is an early 40s one. Okay. Uh, Bob Clampett, The Great Piggy Bank Robbery, Tex okay. Avery, mm-hmm. uh, Tortoise Beats Hair, All right. Ashlyn, probably The Unruly Hair, Art Davis, probably The Super Salesman, and Norbert K will probably be Daffy's Son's Exposure. <laughs> okay. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Hey, Chase, thanks for coming on. You bet. I, I I would love to come back again. Okay. Well, we'll have you back again. We'll, you know, we'll, right. we'll figure out something. Maybe we'll talk about some other cartoons. All right? Sure. I, I would love to. Okay. Very good. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming on. Talk to you soon. Do you have any questions or comments about the podcast? Please email Brian at cartoonerific.com. Your email may be featured in one of our future shows. Hey, well, thank you, Chase, for coming on and talking about uh, the Looney Tunes a little bit. And uh, maybe in the future we'll have Chase back and we'll talk about some other cartoons. So that should be fun. What do you think about this whole situation? What do you think about the uh, streaming thing? Are you uh, happy with the streaming services the way they are, the way HBO Max is and and uh, Disney Plus, please shoot me a line. Tell me what you think. Brian at cartoonerific.com. You can uh, put your concern there in the email, and maybe we'll read it on the next show. Hey, we have a whole bunch of interesting guests lined up for the next couple of weeks, so we hope you come back for that. I know I'm coming back for that, so you should come back for it. It'll be fun. Anyway, if you really like what you're listening to, please subscribe. Go to your favorite service that has the Cartoonerific podcast on it. Click the button and you'll be notified every time a brand spanking new Cartoonerific podcast is uploaded for your enjoyment. There you go. And if you really, really like what you're listening to, please tell a friend. Uh, And let me tell you. Uh, If you know somebody that likes cartoons, it's almost like giving them a gift. It's giving them the gift of animation knowledge or animation fun, whatever way you want to look at it. Uh, But you let them know, and they may actually appreciate it. So there you go. Anyway, the company store is open. You can go there and buy a T-shirt, a hat, uh, a jacket, a mug, and uh, it supports us here. Anyway, I want everybody to have a great day. Have an excellent week. And thank you once again for tuning in. This has been a Cartoonerific Studios presentation. The Cartoonerific Podcast is copyright 2024 by Cartoonerific Studios Incorporated. All rights reserved.